From a and this is Biography. Tonight, Bill Bixby, who broke new ground as a single father struggling to raise a young son. In 1963, the same year Bill Bixby landed a starring role in My Favorite Martian, Hollywood produced a light-hearted movie about a widower and his precocious child. The courtship of Eddie's father starred Glenn Ford as the dad and little Ron Howard as the boy. The film was quickly forgotten, but six years later, ABC decided the concept might work as a weekly series. By then, Martian was off the air, and Bill Bixby took the part as Eddie's dad. As in all his roles, he came across as the essence of a nice guy, something that came naturally. But Bill Bixby's good nature would eventually be severely tested by a series of tragedies that just aren't supposed to happen to nice guys. Don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. The one thing about Bill Bixby is he really liked the guy, no matter who he was playing. People let me tell you about my best friend. Oh, Dad. Well, that's enough. Millions of people loved him for the father that he was to me. It was amazing energy. Energy you don't believe. Marvelous. Oh, come Martin, look, I have got a great idea. Now, you see... Bill's profession dominated Bill. There's no room for him, and he won't know who you are. He lived his work. He loved his work. Life is very cruel sometimes and the timing of everything for Bill was so bittersweet. Bill's influence on television was was monumental. He literally grew up in television and became on some level an icon. In Hollywood, film versions of comic book superheroes have proven to be a winning formula. Now, a big screen version of The Incredible Hulk is in the works. It was actor Bill Bixby who first brought scientist David Banner and his green alter ego to life in the 1970s hit TV show. Just like the Banner character, Bixby battled his own demons. And like the Hulk, he always knew how to make a dramatic entrance. On January 22nd, 1934, in San Francisco's St. Francis Hospital, Jane Bixby gave birth to a son after 40 grueling hours of labor. The 21-year-old housewife and her husband, Bill, named the boy Wilfred, but soon started calling him Bix. Bill and Jane had met on a blind date two years earlier and found they had a lot in common. Both came from strict families where following the rules was paramount. Mr. Bixby was born in the same kind of atmosphere that I was born into. Everything had to be correct everything husband and wife however could not have been more opposite in temperament bill's quiet demeanor offset jane's feistiness i can blow you know i mean i like that and mr bixby would be quite reserved he'd be in the background and he was never forward in any way once married the couple settled into a middle-class neighborhood in san francisco where bill sold heating equipment Jane called the shots at home, making sure the house was always tidy. Everything was exactly in order, and there was not a, anything, there was nothing out of place. She ran the, the house uh, like an uh, admiral in the Navy. Little Bix was expected to fall in line with this kind of discipline, but he had a hard time controlling his energy. His mother kept a close eye on him and tried to refine his behavior. 
any time an older woman a woman came into the living room, if Bill was there, he'd rise out of his chair. If he didn't, his father would probably jerk him out of the chair. I was a mark of respect. The lessons in etiquette didn't always come easily for Bix. The only child was a daydreamer who did whatever he could to put himself in the spotlight. Bix had quite an imagination because he had some boxing gloves. He put on boxing. He put on a boxing match. He'd get to the kids and say, "Okay, I'd be the referee. Ta-da! In this quarter is Blue Belly Willie." He conducted this whole operation. Bill always used to say to our friends when they talked to Bill, "Billy, what do you want to be when you grow up? A fireman, policeman, a lawyer, or whatnot?" I'm going to be an actor, he'd say very seriously. And everybody'd laugh, including his father and mother. Jane wanted to have more children. But that changed with the Second World War. In January 1942, when Bix was eight, his father enlisted in the Navy and was sent to the South Pacific. Jane didn't want the burden of raising a child on her own. So she moved in with her sister, Ellen, and Ellen's son, John. Outspoken and fun-loving, Aunt Ellen nurtured her nephew's gregarious side. She encouraged him to become a professional actor, a dream she once had herself. Because of mom's growing up about not really pursuing what she wanted to do, she was living through Bixie. This is where Bixie got the first seeds, the early seeds of his pursuing his dream rather than trying to pursue the wishes of mom and dad. At the end of the war in 1945, Bix's father returned home to a son he barely knew. Their reunion was strained. Bill's playful insolence clashed with the naval officer's strictness. Big Bill said something to young Bill one late afternoon before we went down to dinner. And young Bill said, oh, Dad, get off my back. Mr. Bixby wasn't used to hearing his son talk that way, Tommy. So he reached out and grabbed him right by the collar and let him fly. Mr. Bixby was so sorry about that, but it was all a case of emotionally adjusting ourselves again. From that moment on, Bix did his best to please his father. He valued his father's opinions. Bix mentioned a few times about how his father was his hero. The senior Bixby resumed his career as a salesman, and Jane took a job at a department store. With both parents working, the outgoing 12-year-old looked elsewhere for attention. He found it at San Francisco's Grace Cathedral. Bix was fascinated by the pageantry of their boys' choir and soon joined it. There he discovered a captive audience in the pews. I would describe his quality, that it quality, as a kind of charismatic magic. I mean, he really had it as a child. Mm, that face. <laughs> he could have sung off note, uh, you know, off key, didn't matter. Bill basked in his performances every Sunday. But when he began to feel he was just another face in the chorus, the boy rebelled. He pulled out a slingshot during one service and hit the bishop in the face with a spitball. Bixby was kicked out of the choir. You probably didn't mean to hit him in the face, you know, but just, uh, he was a target. Bill was always looking for targets, always on stage. Bill's friends loved his pranks, but this was not how he had been raised. His mother again tried to teach her son some manners. In 1946, she signed him up for ballroom dancing lessons. 
Bill made the best of the classes and was always the first to show off his new moves. One evening over a box step, the 13-year-old fell for his dance partner, Jane Sartori. The young couple started going steady and dated through junior high school. He just simply was an entertainer right from the start. One time we were going to a, a dance at one of the hotels in San Francisco, and in the middle of the hotel lobby, Bill bursts into an imitation of Jerry Lewis. I, of course, was mortified, but everybody around thought he was pretty funny, and he was. Bill entered San Francisco's Lowell High in 1948. While his grades were mostly average, he excelled in drama. And like his mother, Bill toiled for perfection, even in his choice of words. To Bill, the English language was very precise. He spoke without slang. He did not like people using slang. It bothered him when someone would use the word kids referring to children. He would say, that's goats. Bill still had his sights set on stardom after graduation, but his parents had other plans for him. They worried about their only son's chance at success in the cutthroat world of entertainment. They didn't have the tools to necessarily cope with this. They wanted him to become a professional or in a profession. A lawyer, dentist, doctor, one of those professions that required a lot of study that meant success just by the title alone. The 18-year-old had nothing against higher education and began attending San Francisco City College in 1952. Then he transferred to Berkeley, his parents' alma mater. His mother and father felt their son was on the right path, but he was still torn between their hopes and his own passion for performing. Bill turned to the only person who always supported him, his Aunt Ellen. Mom basically would say, try whatever you want, whatever you like, whatever you think that you would desire the most. If it doesn't work out, fine. You haven't lost anything. What? An actor in our family? That was the attitude. That had to be overcome. Because we never thought for two minutes Bill would ever be a professional actor. Never entered our bonnets. In 1957, Bill took his aunt's advice. He dropped out of college two credits short of graduation and headed south to Hollywood. The 23-year-old got a job at the swank Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel as a lifeguard and quickly encountered the financial pressures of a struggling actor. That might have been one of the lower points because he, he needed to make money and I don't think he was making enough. And uh, the lifeguard job was a filler. It was the perfect time for him to be discovered. That summer, two ad executives for General Motors noticed the lifeguard and hired him on the spot. He was off to Detroit. There are people who wear sexiness well. They don't have to do anything. It's just there, and Bill had that. He was exciting to look at. He returned to Los Angeles a year later with a string of commercial work behind him and immediately hired an agent. Bill Bixby's acting career was about to take off. Millions of Americans and one Martian would soon know his name. I have rarely seen you make a mistake, but I think you made one this time. Did you see the look on that intern's face? In the spring of 1963, Bill Bixby got his big break. The 29-year-old actor auditioned for a new CBS comedy about a visitor from another planet. The series was called My Favorite Martian. He got a call to go in for this role, and he walked in and he said, Hi, my name is Bill Bixby, to one of the producers, and the producer said, No, it's Tim O'Hara. Basically, he, he hired him on the spot. Bixby jumped at the chance to play Tim O'Hara, an easygoing reporter who sheltered an alien marooned on Earth. Mm -hmm. 
My Favorite Martian premiered on September 29, 1963, and the show was a sleeper hit. Feel it? I can feel it. I can feel it. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's human. Okay. <laughs> now let's do my temperature. Yeah. It was kind of the first time we got a chance to meet a goofy alien and fall in love with them. It was a funny show, but it was also pretty cool because we got to see special effects, which we had never really seen before in a sitcom. The show gave Bixby the chance to prove he had a knack for comedic timing and precise movement. Uncle Martin, I know I wired you correctly. Now, of all the things that happened to you, I know Bixby had a distinct presence on camera that appealed to TV viewers. How can I tell you when you're not here? Now, here, here, will you stay here? He was so easily approachable. I'm, and I'm talking, when I say approachable, I mean that that came off on, on screen, that there was just, was like no nonsense about it. It's really there. I'll be Bix walked into a room and he became the room. Um... Do all Martians talk to themselves like you, or just you? But after three seasons, My Favorite Martian had run its course and was canceled in 1966. Bill always knew that his days as Tim O'Hara wouldn't last forever, but he had made his mark in show business. He didn't have to wait long before landing a role that would mark him as America's perfect TV dad. In 1969, the 35-year-old actor took the part of Tom Corbett, a widower trying to raise a young son alone. The show was called The Courtship of Eddie's Father. We dealt with issues that were talked about but not really brought up, especially not on television. And just the fact that Bill was a single father, he wasn't the first one on TV but I think he became one of the more popular ones because of, because of his easygoing way in which he dealt with this just crazy little kid. But, Dad... Eddie, a deal is a deal. Now, if you don't finish his assignment as you said you would, and I still let you go to the fair, then I'll be going against my own word. Now, I would suggest that you see how much of this assignment you can accomplish tonight. Oh, Dad. Oh, that's enough. The thing about the show was you could just you know, cut the love with a knife. If you could put the Ozzie and Harriet and the Cleavers and all the wonderful families we saw on TV and get all their qualities and put them into one person, it would be Bill Bixby in that role. This show was an even bigger hit for Bill than My Favorite Martian. Soon Bixby was living the fast life of a Hollywood star and became known as one of the city's most eligible bachelors. There are eligible bachelors who have Boku bucks, but Bill was attractive too, so uh, uh, he would date very, very nice ladies. He was out to dinner every night. Bix was fun. But being a ladies' man and a popular TV actor wasn't enough for Bixby. He hoped to excel behind the camera as well and began directing some episodes of his own show. Bill was a perfectionist on the set and enjoyed the creative control. And occasionally, Bixby would lose his cool if orders were not followed precisely. He wanted the best dolly grip. He wanted the best boom operator. And if uh, something called for a specific and didn't happen, you know, his temper could, could rise up. He was extremely intense about his work. And I found him to be a total professional. And that sometimes to some people can be really difficult. Was he a tough taskmaster? Indeed he was. The series began to mean even more for Bixby as he bonded with his eight-year-old co-star, Brandon Cruz. The boy was from a broken home, and Bill became his surrogate father. He just loved little Brandon, and Brandon looked up to him. And a, a guy is always flattered by that. He liked that. Bill would never speak down to me. Bill treated me as an equal. He made sure that we had a lot of time together 
just so he could kind of crawl inside my head and see what, what actually made a kid tick. Bill's relationship with Brandon sparked a desire for a family of his own. By the end of 1970, he was engaged to a young starlet named Brenda Benet. The couple had been dating on and off for about six years. Brenda was quite artistic. She was a dreamer. She was formerly a ballet dancer, played the violin. A very striking girl, very small, petite, and uh, she wanted Bill. One month before the wedding, Bill's father died of a heart attack. Bixby was devastated. The two had set aside their differences years earlier, and Bill was grateful that his father had witnessed his success. After the memorial service in the Bay Area, Bill sprinkled his father's ashes in the Pacific Ocean and returned to the set in Los Angeles. I said, you get better. the busier you are, the better off you're going to be. You can't just sit down and cry. Cry privately at night when you go to bed. That's what I did. He had that type of mentality of the show must go on. You know, that much. I mean, my God, it was just a damn TV show. His father passed, and I guess he realized there was nothing he could do about it. On July 4th, 1971, just four weeks after his father's death, Bill and Brenda exchanged wedding vows. Bixby approached marriage with the same take charge attitude he had on the set. He was directing this scene now. Brenda and Bill Bixby in a home. Okay, we'll do this, we'll do that. No, we'll do some vegetables. That's a, he was always going. In other living rooms across the U.S., Bixby's fans continued to embrace his portrayal of the TV character Tom Corbett. Daddy, huh? I think you could use a little more enthusiasm on that toothbrush. Mm, 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 mm. Come on, come on. Dad, mm -hmm. it's all this brush, and that could wear out my teeth. Yes, yes, brush, brush. Come on, that's come on. Up and down, up and down, all around, all around. Up, that's it, that's it, in between, in between. Very good. <laughs> oh, that was a great sloppy guard. He made Tom Corbett come to life, and millions of people loved him. The way Bill portrayed that father was at first as an actor, and then it became just second nature to him. For his work as Tom Corbett, Bixby received an Emmy nomination for Best Lead Actor in a Comedy Series, but didn't win. Despite its critical success, by the end of the third season, the storyline started to fizzle. ABC pulled the plug on the series in 1972. But Bill Bixby had secured his spot as one of TV's all-time super dads. Soon, though, he would risk his squeaky clean image and show off his dark side. By 1974, Bill Bixby had won an Emmy nomination for playing TV's do-gooder dad in the courtship of Eddie's father. Now he was preparing for the role in real life. On September 25th, Bill's wife, Brenda, gave birth to a son they named Christopher. It was so amazing to see Bill with that kid. He would sing, and, and Bill really couldn't sing too well, but he would sing and whistle. He was a good whistler. Wasn't that great of a singer? That baby boy was just the absolute joy of Bill's life. He approached fatherhood with the same enthusiasm he approached directing a movie or getting up in the morning. Just enthusiastic about, oh boy, oh, I'm going to be a father. That's marvelous. Bill may have been happy at home, but he yearned for an opportunity to show off his broad, dramatic range. At the age of 43, he made a bold move. Bixby accepted the lead role in a new TV series based on the Marvel comic book hero, The Incredible Hulk. He would play Dr. David Banner, a research scientist who turned into a green creature when he became angry. 
He saw the, the innate humanity and compassion that was inside this man. All Dr. David Banner wanted to do was to make this thing go away. <laughs> And, uh, um, and, and that became his odyssey and his struggle throughout. The Incredible Hulk premiered on CBS in March 1978. And by the end of the first season, millions of people were tuning in every Friday night. This is a great show because it gets the whole family involved. And for Bill Bixby, it was great because he could play finally somebody who got to be angry. <laughs> Mr. Sensitive Give got to get pissed I'm off. You a liar. Mr. McGee! Mr. McGee, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Off camera, the actor's intensity sometimes rivaled that of the Hulk. The pressures of carrying a weekly series and meeting his own high standards could be an explosive combination. Bill was very mercurial and he could be incredibly manic and right in your face dr david banner right in there. you know i mean bill and i had nose to nose confrontations a lot of the time and 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 that was bill's way with a lot of people he'd just get right in literally right in your face and uh and be just you know a couple of times on the set if i was late i remember that look he gave me oh boy you really thought he'd be the hulk Bixby's fervor paid off. He had another hit, but the real star in his life this time was his son, Christopher. When Bill wasn't shooting the Hulk, he spent most of his time with his wife and only child. The family often went on vacations, horseback riding in Oregon and camping in Wyoming. All right, Chris, can you wave once? Thank you, back to pictures. But Bill's hectic production schedule and his controlling personality were taking a toll on his marriage. Bill wasn't always that easy to live with. You know, he's, he was a, a volatile man, not in the sense of, of shouting and anger, but I mean, just full of energy and uh, and and not not always easy to to keep down in the spring of 1980 he and his wife Brenda divorced after nine years of marriage Bill gave up custody of five-year-old Christopher I said how come and he said I wouldn't want Christopher to grow up and say at any time accuse me of taking him away from his mother he was more heartbroken, in fact, that he was going to be separated from the son, more so than the divorce. But he lost his child to a certain extent, uh, for, except for weekends. And uh, it was, that was, it troubled him a lot. Then, in early March 1981, Brenda made plans to take Christopher to Mammoth Lakes, California, to go skiing. The boy complained of a sore throat she wanted to go to Mammoth to go skiing and Bill asked her not to go because Christopher was ill and she took him anyway. Brenda assumed it wasn't serious and went ahead with the trip. At the ski resort, Christopher's cold turned into a severe viral infection. His throat swelled and he had trouble breathing. Brenda rushed him to the emergency room where doctors performed a tracheotomy. Something went wrong. Christopher died less than 24 hours later, before Bill could make it to the hospital. It was just absolutely agony. He said he couldn't think, he couldn't, didn't have the desire to work. His whole life uh, went into a tailspin, and uh, it was the most devastating thing that could possibly happen to him. Bixby scattered his son's ashes in the Pacific Ocean, just as he had done with his father's ashes 10 years earlier. The coroner's report suggested Christopher's death might have been prevented had he been treated at a better equipped hospital. Bill directed his anger at his ex-wife, Brenda. He blamed her. He was talking about suing the hospital, suing the doctors. He was. Uh, 
He was just uh, wiped out. He didn't know what, I don't think he knew what to do, but he wanted someone to be responsible for what happened. One week after his son's death, Bill returned to the set of The Incredible Hulk. The way that Bix worked was at a level of fever pitch and, and intensity, and the, the best therapy in the world for Bix was to get back behind the camera and working and focused. He needed to do it in order to give his life a shape so that it could go on. And he just would put one foot in front of the other and create this extraordinary life around him in spite of it. But even work couldn't cushion Bill Bixby from the next blow when he would be forced to face his own mortality. By the spring of 1982, Bill Bixby was in Los Angeles working harder than ever on his hit TV series, The Incredible Hulk. Long hours on the set kept the actor busy, but did little to diminish his grief from the death of his six-year-old son a year earlier. Here you had a very angry man who was playing a man who was not supposed to let himself get angry. And so when he did, it exploded out. Bill blamed his ex-wife, Brenda Benet, for his son's death. She, too, was grief-stricken and had fallen into a deep depression. On April 7, 1982, police found Brenda's body in her Los Angeles home. She had shot herself in the head. Even though they were divorced, even though there had been some hard feelings, actually was kind of the straw that pushed him over the brink. He was severely, severely, severely depressed. One way that Bill handled it was by working really, really hard. But I think there had to be times when he was looking for some sort of solace and some sort of uh, something to cushion the, uh, the feelings that he had. And cocaine reared its ugly head, and he began to get a little trashed. And it took him uh, several long months before he sort of came out on the other side. That same year, the career of the 48-year-old Bixby took a downward turn. CBS canceled The Incredible Hulk after five years on the air. Bill was disappointed that we didn't have the opportunity to, to go on and do more. Do the, the, the episode where Bixby makes the Hulk go away because that's what the whole Odyssey has been about. He felt that the show still had more life to it. So in the late 1980s, Bill revived The Incredible Hulk in a trilogy of TV movies. He produced, directed, and starred in the programs. All of them were shot in Vancouver, Canada, and gave him a break from the demands of Hollywood. It kept the, the set very loose, and it, it helped him to bond with the other actors, too, because then they would you know, play games with him. He would take every opportunity to uh, poke fun at somebody. As seen in these outtakes, Bill could poke fun at himself, too. God damn, this is exciting. Oh, God. All right. Okay, quite, please. Action. I don't even know people in the 818 area code, but what is it like to live in the valley? <laughs> tell me. Tell Happier than he had been in years, Bill started dating again. He met and fell in love with Laura Michael, a 32-year-old hostess at a restaurant in Vancouver. As long as you both shall do. I will. Bill decided to give marriage another try, and the couple wed in December 1990. And will you love him faithfully as long as you both shall do? I will. She was non-challenging, very uncomplicated, you know, rather simple in, in her likes and dislikes and her, her, her tastes. Very different from anybody that he had known, you know, because she's not of this town. And I just don't think there was any conflict. I mean, I mean, whatever he wanted to do was fine, and she went along with it, and they had a good time together. About a month after the wedding, Bixby's friend, Dick Martin, nagged him into going to see his doctor. Bill had been complaining about lower back pain, and the checkup was long overdue. I just said, Bix, you're over 50. You should have a, proct a proctologist take a peek. And uh, no, no, no. Five years, and I 
And I finally took him by the ear. I, I literally said, come on out, God, we're going this way. And I took him in there, and Mike, he never left the office. The diagnosis was prostate cancer. His condition was so severe that doctors removed the organ that night. He thought that he had it whipped. I'll beat this. He looked at cancer much like a movie. Oh, we'll move in for a close-up. And then he'll shoot those magic bullets. After several months of chemotherapy, his cancer seemed to be heading into remission. Bixby regained some of his trademark energy and continued to direct a variety of TV projects. In April 1992, he traveled to Iowa to shoot a movie of the week with Roseanne Arnold. Six weeks later, he returned to his Century City apartment and found a note in the bathroom. His wife of one year, Laura, had left him and moved to Hawaii. The cancer and, and uh, what it took from her to, to help him and, and help him get through his moods and his anger and, and sometimes depression, she couldn't handle it all. When she left him, he was crushed. She just was out of her element. I looked at it just like, just somebody like a child running away when you can't handle something or you can't deal with it. Just minutes after discovering the note, Bixby realized he had an even more serious challenge ahead. His doctor called. The cancer had progressed rapidly and was now terminal. Suddenly all that negative energy that he had had churning in him for so long suddenly was turned toward the positive side of trying to keep himself alive. At 58, Bill Bixby was told he had one year to live. In that time, he would enjoy his most successful romance and form a TV family. No. What is this, you're drinking now? No, it's just a beer. So, it's got alcohol in it, doesn't it? At the age of 58, Bill Bixby was living alone in Los Angeles with terminal prostate cancer. His doctors had given him one year to live, but the headstrong actor and director was not about to let a disease keep him off the set. In October 1992, he began to direct NBC's popular family sitcom, Blossom. This is it, Six. I am so completely in love with Vinny. It's like off the scale. I mean, I thought I was in love before, but that was just kid stuff. This, this is the genuine article. Yeah, but what if it's not, though? But it is. Yeah, but you... The series like focused before, right? on a young girl's coming of age while raised by a single father. More and more intense. Six, listen to me. If it got any more intense than this, my head would explode. Oh, that is so beautiful. Blossom is a perfect fit with Bill Bixby because all his career, the series that he did, there was one thing they all had in common, and that is anybody in the family could watch it. Bill reveled in the company of the cast and crew and tried to downplay his illness. He didn't talk about it, but you could tell by the way he carried himself that, you know, he, he wanted to be seen as, as this kind of, you know, princely sort of presence. His energy was kind of an example of how you can, you can defeat, I guess, anything. Bixby was fiercely determined to live his life as if he were perfectly healthy and even started dating again. In December 1992, friends introduced him to a free-spirited artist named Judith Kleban. Judith was the recent widow of renowned cartoonist Hap Kleban, who created Kleban the Cat. They felt that this would provide relief for both of us, and that since both of us love to hold court and talk and stay up late and, you know, that it might be a valuable friendship. He just wanted someone uh, to be with because he really now had no one. And they were attracted by a mutual, let's hang out for as long as we can. 
when Bill wasn't working in L.A., he would relax at Kleban's estate in Maui. Her home became his sanctuary. The couple enjoyed cracking jokes and trading stories. When there's something as serious as what was going on hanging over your head, time collapses and you just want to really live in the moment. He was outrageous. It was as if we had known each other forever. Still, Bixby's biggest regret was not catching the cancer in time by delaying his own routine checkup. So he went public with his battle and his positive outlook. I have a tendency to push the envelope. If I feel good that day, I go. Yes! And I believe a lot of it is will. I was determined that the day after I thought I was going to die, I'm going to live. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to take my life from me. I will not willingly give it up. My attitude is, just remember, you are living with cancer. You are not dying of cancer. Bixby resolved to live his final days to the fullest. In October 1993, on a bluff overlooking the Golden Gate Bridge, Bill and Judith exchanged wedding vows. Bixby for the third time. He wanted to marry her. She was perfectly happy with things the way they were. And when you're facing your own mortality, you don't, you know, you just cut through it. There's no time for any of the baloney. I completely thought with my heart. And I, I checked my brain at the desk and because the brain was saying, this is nuts. But my heart was saying, this is what you have to do. Six weeks after the wedding, Bill collapsed on the set of Blossom. He retreated to his Century City condo, where doctors warned he might die at any moment. Still, Bixby managed to keep his spirits up. An hour before he died, we had, if you can believe it, we had a, a bit of a, an argument about who loved whom more. It was kind of like two kids. No, I love you more. No, I love you more. He couldn't face what was going to happen to me. That's what he had a hard time with. Bill Bixby died on November 21st, 1993, at the age of 59. His 30 years in show business as an actor and director were riddled with personal tragedies, but he rose above them with endurance, humor, and charm. It took death to make Bill rest. That was the only thing that could stop him. And that, that just shows me what an incredibly passionate man he was about what he was doing. Bill Bixby will go down as one of the most likable people who was ever on TV. Now that's enough. And his shows will air from now till the end of time. I just miss his company. I just miss the person. Yes, I do. Don't ask me any more questions about it. Now, I was very proud of him. And it's times like this that it makes me feel very intense about it, how much I miss him. When I think of him, I just think of that great voice and that smiling face. And no matter when I ever saw him, he was so much fun. He just was so much bigger than life. Even today, I have difficulty thinking that Bix is not going to pick going to pick up the phone and call me because there is such a, a, a liveness about Bix that um, that it's just impossible to sort of imagine the world without him.
For the web's best bios, log on to biography.com.